In these videos, we've been talking a lot about the soils of Beaujolais, and we certainly focus on pink granite because there is this very specific pink granite called Gorg that is important, we think, to Beaujolais. We certainly think we can associate it with some of the better Cru Beaujolais that produce some of the best wines there, but let's talk about some of the other rocks there. Let, let's talk a little bit uh, in specific about some of the particular Cru Beaujolais, and let's talk with Andre Ivanov, who's a master sommelier in San Francisco. Before we talk to Andre, is it okay if we look at some rocks? I like looking at rocks, you know? Wine people, we like to collect rocks, look at rocks. Sometimes we lick them. We do, we lick rocks, this is what we do. This is wine, sorry people, just put up with us. I know, we're annoying. But the particular rock we like to talk about in Beaujolais is Gorg, or this pink granite, as you can see here. Now, it's not all the same everywhere. Sometimes it's deeper, sometimes there's a lot of it, sometimes it's decomposed, a little decomposed, a lot decomposed. Each of those is going to be different because it's gonna allow the vine's roots to dig deeper and deeper, or it's gonna prevent the vine's roots from doing that. So we'll talk about gore, but we talk about other soils too. There's, there's certainly a good deal of shale that you can find here. And there's also quartzite. Quartzite is a, is a stone that we talk about here because of its reflectivity so often. So sometimes the soils here will seem very shiny and, and sometimes not so much, depending upon the quartzite that you get there. And then finally, you'll hear us talk about manganese. Manganese is a rock that doesn't really help the vine at all. It tends to, to make vines struggle just a little bit. And, and in the, the vine growing business, if you were just trying to grow a great deal of crop, that would be a bad thing. And that was what Gamay was known for for a long time, which is why it was looked down upon, was, is that it, it can grow a big crop. That's not what we want. The idea behind growing grapes for making wine is that if you can concentrate the crop, not grow so many clusters, you'll have a more concentrated wine. So manganese, it helps you do that. It does that for you. So we're going to talk about those soils, but let's get to talking to Andre. just being able to take a step back and sometimes like not even you know think too hard about what it is that you're drinking just being able to say that this is just uncategorical you know this is just delicious you know and this is just something that um doesn't need a huge ton of explanation in order for anyone to really kind of sit back and enjoy it and i think that's one of the big draws for me of Beaujolais is that it lets me not worry about any of that other stuff and say come on just sit here and drink this this is, this is delicious you can't say it's not so um, I had the pleasure of tasting two wines last night, so I just, uh, back to back, um, and uh, this is uh, Domaine de Pontou, um, this is uh, Cherubel, and uh, next to that we uh, tasted a little uh, Domaine de Roissier, this is uh, Milano Vaughn. And um, the uh, big thing that I wanted to, uh, to kind of talk to, uh, to the, the, the screen about is uh, the fact that these are two of the communes I think uh, showcase the widest difference stylistically. Um, and so Cherubel, um, along with like um, Saint Amour and to some extent De Julena, they kind of uh, constitute this really lighter, very, very kind of soft, very almost like ethereal kind of style of uh, Cru Beaujolais. Uh, whereas when you get into Moulin Avant, Morgan, Cote de Bury, uh, Fleury even sometimes, but you know, those three especially, you get this dense, you get this, you know, a little bit more of a medium to medium plus body. It's like a, a little bit more tannic even uh, style of wine that um, I think is sometimes over like kind of overlooked by those that think that Beaujolais is just, um, you know, the simple stuff. Um, and uh, part of the reason why it's like Chirubal and I tasted it and I, and I smelled it and it's like the very first thing that hit me is this really kind of more breadfruit character than I was expecting at all. Um, to me, Beaujolais always leads with blue. Um, and this was definitely a case where this is a lot of raspberry and strawberry. Um, the fruit was a little bit more confected in a good way, uh, kind of on the nose. And the wine was just leaner. It was very bright. Um, part of that, obviously, it goes to um, where we are. And the Shiruba being, um, while being one of the smallest crews in terms of production, it is the highest in elevation. And so as you go up, it gets colder. And so you get lighter, leaner kind of uh, flavor profiles in the wine. I think that's very much uh, expressed here. And then uh, soil type uh, wise, um, here, because it's, it's a little bit further to the, uh, to the west than the Milano Vaughn, it's a little bit further away from the river. Um, the soils, I think, here are um, a, little bit, uh, a little bit more uh, sandy, not as compact as they are um, in Milano Vaughn and in uh, Morgan. And so you get a wine that's a little bit more aromatic. 
you know, uh, there's certainly a, a school of thought that has problems with us talking about soil and as having soil having a direct impact upon flavor. Um, I think Beaujolais is just one amongst many, you know, dozens of examples where you go, yeah, but. <laughs> but yeah, but smell this wine and then smell this wine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got no other reason. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a 15 minute drive at most, but uh, yeah, those are, those are quite quite not, not the same thing. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. And I think that's one of the, the cool things about Beaujolais as well is that like, you know, if you wanted to do to geek out and, you know, not just, you know, kind of enjoy it um, on its own, it uh, allows a lot of opportunities, um, especially if you visit the region to say, holy crap, there is a huge world of difference between these two wines. Um, because when we get to the Moulin Avant, um, so for anybody that doesn't know, uh, Moulin Avant um, literally translates to windmill. It's the site of a very historic, very picturesque windmill. And um, this is closer to the river. Um, and why that matters is that um, uh, if you have an idea or have heard of the Mistral before, uh, the Mistral is a strong north wind that comes uh, down from uh, kind of uh, northern France, from the German side, mostly from the North Sea. And um, it kind of it gets into a little bit of a bottleneck just south of where we are here. Um, and, uh, but the bottleneck, you know, it's a V shape. And so while the bottleneck happens here, we're just a little bit above it. So you are getting a little bit more of a concentration on the wind pattern. And the closer you are to that, uh, this yeah. river, uh, you get, a, you get more wind influence, I think. And, uh, you know, for that reason, you know, uh, these wines in, uh, in conjunction with the fact that there's a little bit of uh, manganese in the soil. Um, I think those are the two main uh, reasons why you have a bit of a lower crop, um, and lower average yield in Milan Avant leading to yeah. wines that are more tannic. Yeah, manganese, I mean, uh, we, uh, I wouldn't make any uh, claim that it adds a particular flavor, but it, it is something that creates problems for the vine, essentially. Yeah. And, and um, therefore, the, the sort of prolific character of the Gamay vine itself is, mm -hmm. is hampered, which is not a bad thing. It, no, it creates a, a great, what a lot of viticulturalists would view as better balance in, in those vines. Absolutely. And it's part of the reason why we have these 10 crews of Beaujolais. You know, it's it's not uh, just, you know, the matter of uh, being a political thing and somebody got to it first. Like, no, these are really the 10 best sites probably for making uh, wines that are uh, beyond just kind of your everyday kind of easy drinking sipper. Um, Moulin Avant definitely among the, uh, the, the 10 crews, I think, is among the three kind of the most structured. Uh, it's definitely the one that kind of gave me fits if I ever had problems figuring out if this is a, uh, this is, is this Gamay or Pinot Noir. Um, and uh, the, I think, you know, uh, the soil type and uh, the, um, uh, the location of the, uh, the actual uh, vineyards and the exposure, because a lot of these are east and south facing exposures. They tend to be a little bit warmer. The wines tend to be a little, uh, whereas the Shiruble was a lot of red fruit. This was blue, and this was like a denser, more compact flavor profile. So mm -hmm. um, I think you know, if anybody's uh, looking to uh, kind of get into the differences between the different crews, I think that um, it's a lot, um, it's a lot more beneficial to kind of group them into these um, kind of groups of th of really kind of light and and very aromatic and floral. This more kind of middle of the road, still juicy and delicious, and you're good to enjoy. And then these other three um, or four, depending where you put Fleury, um, are a much kind of a denser and a much more structured style. But I mean, you know, and I think this is a really great opportunity to uh, kind of delve into the, to that bad geeky nerdy aspect of it. But also, you know, just uh, take a step back and realize that, like I said, these are only a 15 minute drive apart, and they couldn't be any, any you know more different um, stylistically for this grape. Um, because the Shiruble is throwing a lot of floral notes. It's red fruit. It's light. This is a big brooding hunk of, hunk of wine over here is is dense and rocky and kind of herby. And like, you know, it's, it's more like, you know, dehydrated blueberries and, and, than anything. Um, but no, it, it, it's it's uh, really great because, you know, like uh, going back to it, it to, to a lot of times to experience wines of this amount of terroir, you have to kind of, you know, step it up in your, uh, in your spending habits as well. And I don't believe you necessarily do in Beaujolais. Thank you for joining us. Up next, I want to talk to Master Sommelier, Laura Manick Fiorati, because she's been kind of at the forefront of, of changing attitudes about Beaujolais, particularly in New York City. <laughs> 